Good evening. I'm glad you can take some time to devote to worship this weekend. Uh, it's a rather cold and uh, kind of drear weekend, which is why I'm recording this video here at home and not over in the church, which is that way, because uh, if I went over to the church, I'd have to heat up the building to record, and uh, I don't want to. It's warm at home, so I'm going to stay here, and then we'll record this, and, and I will. the church will be nice and warm for anyone who is brave enough to come out. Uh, tomorrow, uh, everything is... Uh, has been scooped. Uh, all the snow has been moved away. So we will have worship at Shabina uh, tomorrow morning. I'm looking forward to that. <coughs> I don't have any announcements, so we're going to get right into, we're starting the first of uh, what's going to be a couple Sundays on looking at the practicality of how we understand the sacraments. Uh, we have two sacraments that we, we see, uh, baptism and communion and, and the Methodist Church, and we join in with a bunch of other traditions and seeing uh, that this is the case, saying that seeing that a sacrament is what uh, what God is doing. It's a focus on what God is doing. And, and so there's a lot, some questions that come up with regards to the sacraments that focus on what we're doing and kind of start to, well, miss the point. Like when it comes to baptism, we can start asking like, how much water do we need to use? And does someone need to be dunked or can you be sprinkled or like, how, how does that work? And um that's about what we do. And baptism is not about what we do. It's about what God said God is going to do. And so whenever some amount of water is applied in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, like, that's baptism. And as is just a practical matter, we use as much water as possible. I did, I did a baptize, baptism last Sunday for uh, uh, John Pinkston III, and the little dude had just turned one, and uh, they had to change him afterwards. I used so much water. But, uh, yeah. It's not about how much water we use. John would have been baptized whether I'd use a few drops of water or use as much water as I did, which was copious. We used copious amounts of water. And it's the same thing with the communion. We're looking for what God's doing in communion. And so when Jesus gathers disciples and he breaks bread and gives them the bread, he um, says, this is my body broken for you. Like, what type of bread do we use? Well, we use bread. What type of bread did Jesus use? He used the bread that was on hand for him, and we use the bread that's on hand for us. And we to obsess about what we do would be kind of to miss the point. It's not about us. It's about God. Now, I, I have my favorites. Like, I, I love the Hawaiian bread. I like that a lot. Or a nice homemade loaf of bread. But, like, whatever we have that we recognize as bread, that's what we do. Like, the focus of... um especially for Methodists, like we're looking for how are we seeing God's fingerprints? How are we seeing God at work in these moments? Because it's not about what we're doing. It's about seeing what God's doing and saying, ah, I can get on board. I can be part of that. I can jump in and, and, and partner with, with God and, and get, join in what, what's happening there. <clears throat> to practice looking for these uh, fingerprints, you might say, let's tell a story. A story rooted in history that many of you will be familiar with. If I were to ask you today to name the scariest potential conflicts worldwide, what would you list as the, the top nations you're scared of? For myself, if I had to pick, I'd probably pick Russia and China as being two of the scariest, sort of like, man, if something goes wrong, that, that'd be ugly. But if you go back a century, uh, there are some other options, but like those seem to be what makes sense to me. If you go back a century, go back a century, what would be the answer a century ago? What are the scariest nations when it comes to conflict? What are the nations that you just, you don't want to be involved in conflict because it's going to be horrifying? A century ago, the obvious, overwhelming, and just clear answer is Germany and France. When Germany and France fight, and it's happened twice, right, since Germany was created uh, in, in the 19th century, right, Germany has a relatively short history, but like Germany and France have fought twice, and both times it was so bad that we called it a world war. We have not called anything else that has ever happened in human history a world war. Like, when Germany and France fight, it's bad. 
really, really bad. So a century ago, if you'd ask, like, the scariest thing that could happen, it wouldn't be anything about Russia or China. Like, for a century ago, it would have been Germany and France. You say that they're not getting along. Oh, well, duck and cover. Like, that, that's it's horrifying. All right? And so if we back up a bit, if we go but more than a century, let, let's back up and just understand how they got to that spot and then, then what happened next. So the French Revolution ends in 1799. The French Revolution was this multiple year process that um, it was the overthrow of one of the longest and longest uh, and one of the most strong monarchies and governments in European history, the, the, the French monarchy. It was just for the French um, Revolution to overthrow that was terrifying for the rest of Europe because if it can happen there, can it happen here? And then what happens after the French Revolution ends is Napoleon Bonaparte begins this um, uh, French Empire, and it uh, lasts until 1815. And the French Empire under Bonaparte at one point controls Europe. Like, not just parts of Europe, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. No, it controls Europe. All of Europe. And so... What made this possible was Napoleon invented a new way of fighting war in, in Europe. Up till this point, when the armies of Europe had been deployed, it would have been armies of tens of thousands of people. When Napoleon mobilized the nation, the, the kingdom of France, he called up hundreds of thousands of people to be soldiers. And, and so he created this sort of mass mobilization way of fighting wars that had not been seen before. And so between these two facts that the French Revolution knocked down the well, like the, the strongest um, king the king, line of kings in Europe, arguably, and then Napoleon creates the strongest army that Europe has seen, like France is scary. France, the French Empire fell, Barely, and then what happens after that? After eighteen fifteen, uh, is is Europe is sort of licking its wounds, and then over east of France, uh, it's like hoping that never happens again. And then over east of France, like we usually think of what's east of France as Germany, that didn't exist yet. East of France, there was a bunch of uh, city states, small nations that had spun out and, and had become their own thing after the fall of the Holy Roman Empire back uh, in 1806. And so the Holy Roman Empire goes back centuries before that. It's a different piece of history. But you had places like Prussia and Austria that had fought against Napoleon on their own, uh, but you didn't have like Germany, like uh, this coherent place that called Germany. You had a bunch of like s much smaller uh, city-states and, and nations that were doing their own thing. And so in the decades following Napoleon, Germany was created. <clears throat> and then uh, in the latter part of the 19th century, in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, there's this dude named Bismarck who rises to power in Germany. And Bismarck is the one who wraps Europe together in treaties. Like, we will, if I will protect you, you will protect me. It's sort of this, Bismarck's goal was to create peace through these treaties that would bind, because Bismarck is still not that far off from the the true hellish fighting of the, the Napoleonic Wars. Like, people still remembered that when, when he was kicking around. And so we need to create... <clears throat> something that will hold the peace. And so he makes all these treaties. Okay. So that gets us into the early 1900s. And so as Europe enters the 20th century, the 1900s, it looks like it's going to be peaceful. French, uh, the French people, the Fr France has not been acting up and, and Germany it is pretty stable. So it's going to go fine, right? Except we know that's not the case. In 1914, France and Germany go to war, and it is so bad that it is called it is called the war to end all wars. About one in twenty people die in, in France and in Germany. Like one in twenty. If you think about that math, that is just 
terrifying. One in 20 people. Um, <coughs> and so at the end of the war to end all wars, it's so bad that we can't even conceive of having another war. This is so terrifying and ugly and traumatic and so many people have died. It gets to the end of the war to end all wars. And what the, the treaty that ends this war is called the Treaty of Versailles. And people are so scared that something could happen again that they just kick Germany. And they kick Germany really hard. And they, they it, it, it didn't work. All right. There are some arguments that can be made, and they're fairly convincing, that World War II really is World War I, Part Two, because the Treaty of Versailles kicked Germany so hard and, and cornered and kicked Germany. And if you corner and kick someone, all they have left is to lash out. And I, I realize I'm simplifying and, and covering, oh, overlooking lots of details. But World War I happens, and then World War II is even worse. World War II is just terrifying. And, and it ravages a generation. It leaves Europe in really bad shape. It is – World War II was so bad for Europe that on the other side of it – America developed something called the Marshall Plan, which was to take American dollars to rebuild Europe because the realization was American, the American economy cannot thrive if we don't have someone to trade with, and Europe can't trade with us if they're whooped. So we got to spend some money, a lot of money to do something. It's a moment, uh, the Marshall Plan and the GI Bill post-World War II are two of the things that America can be, most, can be just most proud of in modern history. Like It's amazing those two acts of, of generosity and, and, and investment. <coughs> this all brings us up to 1951. And this is where things get really interesting. Well, at least for the purposes of this, this sermon. Because in 1951... They have to decide what's going to happen next. Germany and France are still terrifying. Like if you, it, we're still at the point where if you asked, what is the, uh, what is, where, 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 what would be the most scary conflict you can imagine? France and Germany are still going to be on that list of like, oh my God, they better not fight because we can't take another world war. Like if they, they throw down again, we might not make it. Like it is. It is really a scary moment. So 1951. Um, and what happens? Like, in both both of these, France had, had, had shown that you can't create peace in Europe through the sheer mil military might, because if that had been possible, Napoleon would have done it, because he had controlled all of Europe with his armies that were larger than anything that had been seen before. And, and uh, if you could create peace in, in Europe through uh, treaties, through formal treaties, like, Bismarck had tried that. So what are they going to do to create peace? Because they cannot afford to have another war. They can't afford World War III. Uh, so this is what happens. In 1951, the European Steel and Coal Community was formed. It was formed for the express purpose of not only making war unthinkable, but further, just practically impossible. War takes steel. And if you make steel between France and Germany, if you're making steel together, your steel, I mean, they would just know because you can't make war without steel and you're making steel with the person who we're afraid you could go to war with. In 1957, the European Economic Community was then created, <coughs> which then started the ball rolling further so that it leads to the um, European Communion, the European Parliament, the European Court of Justice, uh, Eurovision, like there, they start being these social things that 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 bind cultures together. Eurovision begins in 1950. It's a music competition between the various uh, nations uh, uh, that make up Europe. <coughs> the shared soccer leagues. Um, yeah, we have these formal uh, practices of welding the economies together, and then the formal practices of welding uh, the the cultures together. Your uh, soccer and, and music. And then in 1981, it got to the point where you could travel across borders uh, easily. There wasn't like border. I mean, here's here's my passport. No, off you go. I mean, well, there wasn't. It was very low key, and so people started being able to vacation freely between all the various uh, nations in the European Union. <clears throat> and finally, a common currency was developed: the euro. It was not a given that the euro would work. I remember when the euro was ruled out, 
And um, it was not a given that that was, I mean, there, I heard, I remember hearing people talk about the plans, like if this crashes and burns, how will they recover? <coughs> but that gets them to the point where you can travel wherever you want in Europe. You can live wherever you want because you're going to get paid in a common currency. And so um, if we look at Europe today, the European Union, where they're at is that it's worked. Like it has fundamentally worked. We haven't had another war between France and Germany. And if, in fact, if you look across the Europe, uh, the entirety of Europe, you'd, you'd see like Italy's a hot mess. Because it's always a hot mess. Italy was founded in uh, 1861, and and Italy has a centuries long tradition of, of uh, the nation, the city states just hating each other, not getting along, and they still don't. And so, Italian politics are a mess. Italy is always a mess, right? Greece is still reeling from the economic explosion that it had in 2007. Turkey is uh, fading away from uh, democracy under its president Erdogan. Um, Britain lost its mind and did this whole Brexit thing. Like, let's just punch our econ economy in the gut multiple times and make it really hard for our economy to thrive. Brexit, that's a great idea. So they're going through the tail end of Brexit. <coughs> I confess I don't know as much about Spain, but you know what's working really well in Europe right now? France and Germany, right? France and Germany get along. They are the core. They are the heart of the European Union. A nation that, these two nations a century ago, were the nations that when they fought, they, it was called a world war, right? The two nations that were most likely to cause world war because they've already done it twice. Not, and now they're neighbors. Now they get along. Now they are at the core of the European Union, not because Napoleon could scare everyone into doing what they were told because of his armies, not because Bismarck was so smart he could create peace through treaties. They're at the heart of Europe because they're neighbors, and they travel back and forth, and they have shared food and shared economy and shared uh, goals, and it's just they have become neighbors. That's the and so it's just fascinating. A century ago, France and Germany. Ah, now it's like, yeah, well, whatever. Like they get along. We're not worried about it, and that's amazing. Inasmuch as Jesus's greatest goal is to bring us into the kingdom that is to come, the kingdom that He is the Prince of Peace, the kingdom that He is drawing us into this shalom, this peace that that is not just the absence of conflict, but the real neighborliness that is made possible through forgiveness. And reconciliation, uh, I see the fingerprints of Jesus in this. I look at the story of Europe over the last two centuries, and, and that's what I see at, at play. I see God's fingerprints. I see that peace is possible as people are weaving their lives together. And, and it's not when it's convenient or easy, because if you go back to when the European Union started back in 1951 with the European uh, coal and steel uh, community, in 1951, the people making the decisions to start that organization were the people whose children died in the wars, the children who should have sat at their table at Thanksgiving, but there were still empty chairs. These are the people who chose to start being neighborly with each other and sharing their economies, sharing their most precious industrial resources, steel and coal. Like, they killed my children, and I'm going to weld my... That's a bad pun. I'm talking about steel. I'm sorry. They're, we're going to bind our, 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 our economies together, starting at steel and coal, at the very most basic building blocks. It shows us that peace is possible when people choose to be neighbors, when they choose to see each other and eat together, which is how this comes back to baptism and communion. Baptism shows us who we are family with. If you're baptized, you're my brother, you're my sister. We're family. That's what it means to be baptized. We are the people who have accepted that we are forgiven and are now part of the church where we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And then we are all welcome to communion because to be a brother and sister is not just an abstract thing. It's a very practical way of life that we're going to eat together. We're going to live together. We're going to weld our economies together. We're going to bind ourselves together so that we live life together. And there are a lot of family out there that we we don't acknowledge as family and we don't eat with. 
what we do on Sunday, we baptize people and we come to communion, is practice thus for how the rest of the week can, and dare I say should, unfold. I don't expect anyone to uh, leave church on Sunday and then go out and, and call people to the table and create peace between war uh, nations that had recently been at war. But I think it's entirely possible that we can go out and we can share a coffee or a meal with someone that it would be surprising for us to do so. And to do so because that's what Jesus did. Look at who Jesus brought to the table. <clears throat> he invited everyone to the table. Even in his disciples, we see this amazing mix. He brought together the tax collector and the person that taxes were collected from. And tax collecting back in the first century were not like you just sent the check off to the courthouse. Like if you didn't pay your taxes, they would you could the Roman tax collectors could hire muscle to extract it from you. Like it was not a a healthy relationship. And yet those are the people Jesus had in his disciples, a tax collector and the people who were being taxed. Jesus had people who were highly educated and people who were uneducated. People He brought together people who were utterly committed. Thomas, let us go down to Jerusalem that we might die with him. To the people who were seemed committed, Peter, I'll, I'll die with you. And then he, no, I don't know him. And he, he denies Christ three times and then the cock crows, that famous story. And then there are people who are just not committed at all that Jesus invites to the table. Judas, right? Jesus gathers people of surprising types to gather to eat meals together. That's what Jesus did. And what happens when we share these meals? Well, I don't know yet. But I know we follow the Prince of Peace. And I, and I know that when people weave, choose to weave their lives together, peace can be made in ways that are utterly surprising, maybe even more surprising than the fact that France and Germany get along now. We see the fingerprints of God in that, and we can see the fingerprints of God in our lives as we go to invite people to share our table, to be neighbors, to love our neighbors even. Thanks be to God. Go invite someone to coffee. Amen. Stay warm. And uh, I look forward to seeing uh, pe some people tomorrow and uh, more hopefully next weekend when Missouri stops trying to kill us and uh, I can preach in the church and not in my living room. So may the peace of Christ be with you.